Hello, um, this is Charles Vanover um, from the University of South Florida. And I am one of the co-editors of the book, Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Research After the Interview. And I'm actually interviewing one of our co-editors, Paul Myhouse, about a, some very important content that helps organize and sort of guide the book. And without saying anything more, um, I'm going to put Paul on and have him start. Hey, thanks, uh, Charles. Um, I'd, li I'd like to uh, talk today about uh, the qualitative research life cycle, which was one of the core concepts of our book and kind of helped us um, keep track of what our focus was. And so I'm going to um, dive more into that here today. Our book also presents a, a glossary, and I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the language. And sometimes language really bogs people down. Some of the jargon gets to be unwieldy. I, I'm borrowing some, some um, language here from Mark Bagley, a, a brilliant phenomenologist. And he talks about the levels of inquiry. And at the, at the sort of the top ontological layer, we have worldviews or paradigms. And next we have traditions and approaches and, and methods, and let's kind of break this down a little bit, a little bit more. So with, with worldviews and paradigms, what we're really talking about are things like constructivism and pragmatism and critical social theory. So these are very, um, very um, kind of um, all-encompassing um, paradigms that really permeate everything we do. The way we think about the nature of reality, the, the way we think about knowledge building and knowledge acquisition, and um, how we sort of incorporate values in our work. Um, worldviews are, are, are kind of swimming around us and we're swimming in them. Um, but underneath that, we have kind of another umbrella uh, regarding traditions and approaches. And that's when we start to use terms like grounded theory or ethnography or narrative analysis. And so that is a particular lens within a worldview. Well, why would that be like important for a beginner starting their work, or maybe a teacher trying to help people understand how to do qualitative data analysis. Sure. So um, for, for a, a teacher, I think this is helpful because it's, it, it kind of um, breaks down methodology into components. And so rather than just starting out and talking about grounded theory or talking about narrative analysis, let's back up a minute and, and um, think about what our assumptions are regarding ontologies. What are our assumptions about epistemologies before we get into the conversation about grounded theory or ethnography or, um, or a case study? And so this really um, slows us down in a good way so that we can have some important conversations about, you know, how, what do we think of, how do we think of the world? How do we think of data as being an index of reality? Or do we think of data more like um, dis discourse that's, that's sort of um, floating around? And so um, this is kind of breaking down that conversation so that as instructors, we can step students through this. And as students, we can ask ourselves, you know, what do, what do I think of, uh, what, what do I think about the nature of reality and how do I, um, how do I think about data collection? And, and it sort of allows the student to kind of step through these, these terms and think about how it really applies to their own work and their own journey. So, so then, you know, underneath, um, underneath our, our traditions, we have our, our methods, our methods of data collection. So once we've decided upon narrative analysis or grounded theory, we have to ask ourselves, well, what kind of data am I actually co collecting? Am I doing online interviews? Am I gonna go out and observe people? So this is kind of the next decision-making step for us as researchers. And that leads, of course, into the question of analysis. And that's when our book really kind of, um, uh, that's, this is what our book kind of expands, right? And we really, really slow down and, and unpack this idea of analysis. With analysis, we're talking about detailed examination of data and get really getting into the weeds. And with interpretation, we're talking about making meaning and making claims. What does it mean to, to actually know something based on the, the uh, examination that you've done? So could you 
for like a beginner, could you talk about the difference between analysis and, and interpretation? How do they differ? How are they the same? Right. So um, sometimes the the um, the line is slippery between the two. Um, for for example, with coding, you know, we talk a lot about just taking pieces of data and coding them or, or marking them or labeling them somehow. That is an analytic act, right? And it and it might involve some interpretation, but really, what the, the difference here is that interpretation is really taking all the coding you've done and turning that into something meaningful. And so I think of interpretation as, as synthesizing and integrating and, and not just labeling. So it's going one step further. Uh, it's, it's further up the conceptual ladder because it's forcing us to ask ourselves, what is meaningful about all of these little things I've done and all these little um, things that I've been attentive to? So, so I think of analysis as um, uh, kind of looking, looking at uh, under the microscope and looking at our fragments, and interpretation is maybe taking a step back and synthesizing. That's great. Yeah, very helpful. And so um, I'm going to keep going with with uh, terms here. I know that um, the the glossary um, is is sort of sometimes people just want to skip over it, right? But I think it's important to slow down and ask ourselves, well, what, what do we mean by these by these terms? And so we also um, have added to our glossary this idea of practices, different from methods and different from um, the other terms. A practice is a specific analytic task, like in vivo coding or like theme building. And um, I think of of um, of you know the the the, the variety of ways in which team building has been discussed. I know that the Brown and Clark refer to it as a method, but other people like Jan uh, Jan Morris refers to it as a practice. And so that that's when these terms start to really matter because we want to sort of um, understand how we're using a particular a particular um, uh, term. And so we have in addition to practices strategies. So a strategy is not just a practice, it's a practice used for a particular purpose. So I'm going to uh, take um, quotations and use them to develop poems. Or I'm gonna use in vivo codes, the, the language of the participants to build themes. So in talking about a strategy, I'm not just talking about a way of doing something, I'm also revealing the purpose of it. Yeah, and then here is something um, maybe for teachers of qualitative research. Um, like one of the things that I am so proud of about our book is, you know, this glossary idea, but especially the idea of strategies, right? That we're really trying to help people figure out how to make good decisions and think strategically, intent, you know, intentionally about the data. And so we've organized it, you know, this approach down into our glossary, down into the terminology we use. And all of that, most of that comes from Paul, like that really focus. Um, it's just what's was so exciting, or one of the things that was just so exciting about developing. And I would, I would also say that for the student, um, what might be helpful is for them to write a memo on each of these terms based on uh, how do they think of uh, their world worldview? How do they think of their um, uh, qualitative tradition? What methods are they using? What practices and what strategies? So each of, these, um, uh, each of these terms becomes a memo for them to write about. So they can really articulate where they are in their in their understanding of their own work. And, and I, I find what happens when people take the time to write about each of these things, it, it makes it clear where their gaps are. If I don't really know, if I know what my practices are, but I don't, don't know what my strategies are, well, then something's missing, right? If I know that I'm doing coding, but why am I doing coding? You know, so- yeah, Why? Right, right. And so um, by slowing down and asking yourself to kind of um, uh, un unpack and write about each of these things, uh, it makes it clear to yourself as a researcher what might be missing in your work mm -hmm. or, or where things might be fuzzy. Um, even going back to the, to the ontological level, um, you know, um, a structuralist is thinking very differently about the world than 
a phenomenologist. So, you know, uh, you know, who am I? What is my identity given this study? Like, how do I want to enter this space? All right, so let's uh, look uh, a little bit more at the, the, the research life cycle here. So this diagram is sort of depicting the movement between these phases, starting with design, moving into data collection and transcription, if we're talking about interviews and focus groups, and then moving into analysis and, and, interp and interpretation, and then our, our, our research products. But no, just notice the arrows here, we are constantly moving. And even in the design phase, we might be thinking about analysis, right? Going back to our, our previous slide, looking at, at practices and strategies, we might already be thinking about those strategies from the very beginning. So we're not waiting till the analysis phase to think about, oh, should I code or should I memo? We're, we're already at the very beginning being sensitive to those decisions. And our, for our book, one, again, one of the things that I like about it is that it helps people conceptualize the analysis and interpretation in the design. So just building on what you said, you know, the idea is to really, um, you know, envision this journey knowing that you're not going to be exactly sure where you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and notice also that we might, we, we might, during data collection, go back to design and redesign. Um, because we might notice something in data collection that um, activates a different kind of research question, right? And so to some degree, these arrows can also go in the other direction for, for some of them. And that complicates this as well, right? We have to really think on our feet and really be comfortable with um, this idea of, of emergent emergent uh, data collection, emergent design, emergent discovery. Um, that's kind of putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to be sensitive to the possibility of, of evolution and, and change. So um, let's talk a little bit more about what the life cycle is allowing us to do, what, what it's inviting us to do. It certainly is allowing for uncertainty, maybe even embracing uncertainty, right? Um, there's a lot that we can learn in this, in the, in the, um, in, in allowing ourselves to not be, not to um, be governed by certitude, and to kind of let the data guide us along the way. Um, the life cycle gives us space for emergent design, and it gives um, the data a lot of, um, a lot of um, direction. It's sort of not. Um, um, it's not sort of inviting us to think about a predetermined course of action. And I'm kind of um, drawing on Ray Maeda's work from Research Talk. Ray has been uh, a mentor of mine for, for many years now. And he, he talks about how data um, um, allows us to direct our own discovery. And, and in other words, data, data kind of teaches uh, us how, to, how it needs to be analyzed, right? And so that's a, a core um, concept in his own work. Um, so what this means is that, um, the research life cycle is kind of allowing us to build a particular analytic apparatus. Um, so even though we might have anticipated coding, once we get into the data, we might realize, oh, I really need to do this kind of coding. Um, and Johnny Saldana's book, uh, The Coding Manual, um, talks about, for example, uh, process coding, looking at ING words. The minute we shift into that, into that looking at actions and behaviors, well, that's a certain kind of approach that is a certain kind of practice, I should say, that is allowing, allowing us to, to see data in a certain way. But we're kind of building that apparatus as we're in the data. Um, we don't necessarily have um, um, a complete blueprint ahead of time. We're kind of designing that apparatus while we're, while we're in the data, rather than relying on a pre-existing formula. The, um, the research life cycle is also um, inviting both synthesis and openness. In other words, we're both condensing, condensing data into something more manageable, but also expanding, expanding um, using things like memo writing. Um, so it, it is this interesting blend of integrating and synthesizing as well as being open to expanding and maybe even collecting more data or, or wanting to see how data links to other kinds of data, which is something that, um, um, one of our chapters in our book, the one by George uh, Camberellis, um, gets into in more detail. 
we also see the research life cycle as allowing us, allowing us to make decisions that are distinctive to each study. Um, no two studies are alike. I think every chapter in this book really underscores that, that we're seeing how um, each researcher had to kind of wrestle with their own um, challenges, given what they were seeing in the field, given what the data was like, and had to construct a very um, particular kind of a set of practices and strategies. I don't know, Charles, if you have anything you wanted to share regarding that. You know, the one question is for on both of these slides is that, um, so I'm a beginner, just imagine, um, as I was, and I come sort of from a quantitative shop, which is all about precision and, um, you know, standard error, really, you know, precise measurement. And then suddenly, the arrows could go this way, but the arrows could also go that way. Everything's emergent, everything's uncertain. But then I need to, at the end, finish right up, get to the end. Could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I think what happens um, during the, the life cycle is that we are kind of gaining momentum with our own understanding and we're becoming more intimate with the data, meaning that as we develop um, a code book that really um, is congruent with the data, that aligns with the data, then we start to see how our understanding is leading to something that's more meaningful and something that is more like a claim that we might um, be more familiar with from the quantitative background, right? Quantitative people love claims, right? They love this kind of certitude. And um, we are, even in, this, um, even in this realm, we are moving to a place where we can make some claims based on what's in the data and using the data um, as evidence. Some people don't like the word evidence, but we might instead talk about um, the range of voices and partnering with our participants' voices and kind of braiding of the researcher voice and their, vo their voice to, to make a claim, to make a statement, to, um, to find something that um, is meaningful. That could be a theme, or that could be the, the beginnings of something more theoretical, as we see in grounded theory. That's right. yeah, uh, but but you're, you're, you're right that there, there is sort of a different set of muscles that we're using here, right? Um, because we're not just um, um, doing doing a logistic regression as it's, as it's been defined. We're instead um, forcing ourselves to live in this, to inhabit this data and think about, well, you know, would, would in vivo coding be the right thing to do here given all the metaphors? Um, and so we're really um, suspending um, our certitude um, because we have to really listen to the data and listen very carefully to the data. So um, kind of revisiting this idea of the, the uh, early days of, of, of design, I, um, I'd like to talk about the point of departure, what is kind of helping to guide you. If you have a theoretical framework or you have done a extensive lit review and have a conceptual framework that is to some degree your compass, but the question is, how much are you relying on that compass? Um, how, how much are you relying on it? Uh, or there might be more than one compass, which gets to be a challenge. Um, you might have you know, uh, competing theories that you're trying to somehow reconcile. There are theories of the self, for example, that, that indicate that the self is fairly permanent over time, um, that who you are as a six-year-old is basically who, who you are as a middle-aged adult. There are other theories of the self that, that show that we're kind of definitely evolving in unexpected ways over the life course. Well, there, th those are sort of, you know, like, what do we do with that? You know, those are really two compasses. W what do we do with that? And so in the design stage, we're trying to um, figure that out. Um, Mark Bagley uses the term unlearning, what you need to unlearn as you move into the field. I love that. Um, as, 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 um, you know, academics, we like to rely on knowledge, like to sort of feel good about what we know, but now we have to kind of put that aside and ask ourselves to be more humble and think about um, what assumptions we, are, we what assumptions we have that are getting in the way. 
and to put that aside. I'm also going to borrow a, phrase, a term from um, Marguerite uh, Sandalowski. She talks about the semantic plane, and I'm using it here in a kind of different context. But the question here is, what semantic plane are you entering? Um, what I'm getting at there is what um, level of abstraction are you working with? If your research question is something like what, what, is, what does school bullying look like currently in 2021, you are, you are sort of describing, you are setting yourself up to describing um, the world of school bullying. What, who is witnessing it? Where is it happening? What does it look like? Is it verbal? Is it physical? Um, in person, online? Um, when is it happening you know, after school, during school? So that is sort of fleshing out um, descriptively school bullying. That's a particular semantic plane that is more descriptive, more tangible. But I might instead be entering a semantic plane with the very same topic, school bullying, that is much more abstract. I might be looking at things like identity formation, where um, the, the victim is taking on the identity of the bullying because it, it's, it's, it's happening so often or the identity of being the bully. Um, and so that language becomes much more um, um, abstract. Um, and the question is, you know, what, what semantic plane or planes, plural, am I working, working in? Um, and for a student, I think this is really important because you want to make it clear to yourself um, whether you are simply trying to do a rich description of something or whether you're trying to, to reach for more sociological um, kinds of conceptualizing. So certain disciplines might invite you to, to be more theoretical than others. Yeah, I think that those are really good dis distinctions. And um, I like the metaphor of, um, you know, it moving on my qualitative journey with two different compasses that might take me different places, that give me different readings. Um, and again, the idea of unlearning of it is so critical to our work, um, but is something that's hard to do and hard to remember if you're just trying to get things on, if you're just trying to knock those chapters off. Um, yeah, I, I really, I thought those are all really good ideas. And again, this is this is a place to slow down, right? And when you when you write down a research question, uh, write it ten different ways, right? Um, because uh, every single word really counts in a research question. And just changing the verb, changing one noun, might really change your compass. Um, it might change where you're headed, and so it might change your semantic plane, right? Um, so think about. Um, investing time in all of these things to really think through your design phase. So these are some other, other questions that come to mind. Like once I've sort of thought about a research question, the next thing is like, what kind of data collection do I need um, to do? Um, am I looking at, looking at lived experience? That, Max Van Manen uses the term, the, the living now, which I really love. Um, is, that what you're, is that what you need to find out? What, the, what is the living now of bullying, right? That could be where I'm headed with my data collection. Um, alternatively, I might be interested in storytelling, which is um, looking at sort of how a particular episode, like being bullied or bullying somebody else, how that leads to a particular kind of story with a certain kind of protagonist and a certain kind of outcome. But in telling stories, we also are revealing knowledge and values and attitudes. So this is the thing I love about storytelling is because it does so much work. We, we get far more than just a story. We also get information about all these other things like knowledge and values. Um, another, another question to ask after you've uh, decided on a particular uh, question or topic is whether you need memory synergy, uh, a term from George Camborellis. Memory synergy is kind of looking at um, how somebody else's experience might might um, trigger your own memory. So if we had, you know, a focus group of people who have experienced school bullying, they might um, be able to have a dynamic kind of conversation that's different from just interviewing one of them or, or interview, interviewing them separately. So is memory synergy something that I need to bring into the foreground of my work? in order to answer my research question. 
another possibility is observation of witnessing um, an event or an episode, witnessing the present. Um, Cambrell's term I, I'm using here is the production, the continuous production of reality. And would it help for me to kind of be um, present in a school if I have IRB approval uh, to witness what's happening in the hallway, witness, witnessing what's happening in the lunchroom, and that that sort of um, um, observation might give me more uh, immediate um, uh, touchable data, so to speak. And then finally on the list here is deciding how to transcribe the data. Or if I'm going to transcribe, I might simply just listen to things over and over again, as some people have done. Um, but this goes into you know, how do we represent an embodied event? I might decide to do video in order to capture more of the embodied, um, embodied um, nature of that episode. But there are lots of things here um, for us to consider. So again, let, let's slow down as researchers, as students, and as, as instructors, let's, let's kind of present these options to our students so that we can really um, think about the, the huge array here of possibilities with data collection. Yeah, I think that's great. It's such a powerful slide. Um, what would you say the living now is? Could you talk a little bit more about that? That's just a great. Yes, I, I, I love to think about this because it's such a hard, slippery concept. Um, if if you ever if you've ever had a super productive day, um, you might notice that you didn't realize that you were being productive until you got until you went, got home and you sat on the couch. You realized. Gosh, I got a lot done today. I was really in the flow, but but while you were in the flow, you were just doing some. You were doing that thing. You weren't thinking about what you were doing. You were just doing it. Um, that is what the living now is. It's it's that it's that um, it's an awareness unaware of itself. It's an awareness unaware of itself. So when you are in that moment of flow, you don't know that that's what it is until later. So how do I how do I investigate? How do I explore? How do I research something like that? And, and the same would be true for something like school bullying. Um, I, I might uh, I might sort of be um, pushed um, pushed down. And I was I was bullied to some degree in middle in junior high. So this is a personal thing for me that um, sometimes I didn't realize until later that, that, that's what, that, that is what that was, right? Um, I, 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 in, in the moment, I was just experiencing myself in my body and that was the living now, right? Just experiencing my, the, the sensations of being pushed down or pushed into a locker. Um, this the idea of being bullied, conceptualizing, conceptualizing that didn't happen until later. Maybe it was 10 minutes later, maybe it was a day later, but it wasn't, it wasn't the living now. The living now was a, a different kind of thing. It's a very slippery thing, right? But but we're making a distinction there, and that's that's what phenomenologists try to do. They try to open up the living now, um, which not not all research is attempting to do. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And um, again, the ideas of the continuous production of reality, um, which is so important for us to think about you know, right now, seeing continuous production non-reality <laughs> or whatever the reality yeah. of our non-reality is. Right. Um, okay, let's go, yeah. And so I don't want to, to dwell too much uh, too much longer on, on design issues, but this is just sort of um, a reminder of all of the things that come into play when we get start to get into the weeds. Um, how, are we, how are we activating time in our work? Are we, are we following people into the next six months or are we simply asking them about their, their past? Um, if we're doing focus groups, what is, what is the composition of those groups going to be? Are we gonna combine different um, gender identities and so forth? So all of these things that um, we talk about with design. But let's talk a little bit more about uh, analysis and interpretation, which is really the focus of, of our book. Um, and I, I talked about sem the semantic plane earlier with um, design, but it really comes into play in, and into the foreground in analysis. When we think about the, the uh, task of describing what's happening in the data, taking inventory, uh, describing is really looking at the who, what, where, and when of data. Um, and, but then we might move into more conceptualizing 
where we're getting more abstract and um, thinking about things more conceptually, um, more abstractly, um, moving up the conceptual ladder, as it were. Uh, we might move from conceptualizing to theming or thematizing data. So, so here I'm making a distinction between concepts and themes. This is, this is also something that Johnny Saldana does, um, a distinction that he often makes. You know, a theme is more of a statement. Um, um, so if you add an adjective and a verb to a concept, um, you're getting more of a, of a, of a story of an arc, story arc, that becomes your, your theme. So, so an example of a theme might be something like, you know, I, I, I'm going back to the bullying example. There's this idea of secondary uh, victimization where the victim kind of takes on and kind of bullies um, themselves and sort of is feeling bad and kind of internalizes what is happening. So that's a concept, right? But how do I turn secondary bullying into something that's more of a claim or a statement? And that would be the challenge of making that into a theme. So a theme is more than an idea. It's doing something with that, that idea to make it more meaningful. And then finally, theorizing is really, really getting into um, far more um, abstract language and thinking about the impl implications of, the, of, of, of this. A theory is more, more trying to explain like why, why is this happening? What is the mechanism of bullying happening in the schools? And why is it happening? How do I explain that? So um, that um, interest in, ex in explaining moves us into this different uh, semantic plane. Yeah. So with practices and engaging data, um, Going back to this, you know, again, going back to our glossary, right? This idea of practices, um, we're thinking about different ways of engaging data, like coding and categorizing. Coding is a form of condensing, as is categorizing. Categorizing is sort of taking our codes and clustering them into higher categories. But then with memos, we are, um, which is another practice, right? Just to writing, writing down, and developing a relationship with the data via writing. And again, writing is a way of knowing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of knowing. It's, it goes into our epistemological uh, practices. And this is a way of taking data and expanding upon it, elaborating, reflecting on it, um, thinking about how this piece of data echoes another piece of data so that we are kind of indexing the two. Um, so that's another practice that we could um, use in our analysis. Um, we have uh, a chapter in the book looking at drawing as, a, as an approach. Um, drawing is a way of de depicting data in a different way, uh, looking at it more visually. Um, the visual mind is another form of intelligence, right? We don't want to turn that off if it's a vehicle for understanding. Um, another, another possibility is using note cards and mapping. Um, uh, Jamie Fiddler's chapter in the book looks at using note cards, index cards. And Alison Welker and George Cambrellis's chapter looks at mapping. And so these are ways of linking, linking data with other data and of creating threads, right? Um, so that we're not, we're not simply looking at things as individual atoms, we're seeing how things echo and reflect other things. It gets very complicated, um, but these are our tools for again, finding meaning and for not getting lost along the way. Talk a little bit more about the difference between condensing data and expanding it. Because I think those are very powerful notions, but especially like people may not understand how to expand data through memo writing, mm -hmm. given that condensing again is supported through survey, a lot of quantitative work. Intense. Yeah. So, so let's let's talk about let's talk a bit more about about those distinctions. So, um, I'll I'll draw an example from my own work. Uh, years ago, I I uh, interviewed uh, people undergoing chemotherapy as well as cancer survivors, and there was one um, participant who who referred to himself as a cancer graduate, a cancer graduate, right? And so. Um, I don't want to condense that into something smaller. I want to expand 
upon that idea of cancer graduate. And what, what I did as I wrote a memo about it, and I realized when I looked at more of his data that he was talking about knowledge acquisition in many ways and how during the course of chemo, he learned more about his body, he learned about disease, and it was like this mini degree. And, and so this, I, this cancer graduate metaphor, when I started to unpack it and unravel it and expand upon it in my writing, it, it turned into this much bigger thing that I would have otherwise um, neglected if I was only interested in just condensing what was there in the data, right? And so um, sometimes there are these little stowaways in data um, and cancer graduate as a metaphor was a stowaway that I needed to uh, unpack and enlarge and expand upon so that I could understand the power of that uh, metaphor for that person. But then I did that with, with other people in the study as well. Um, somebody else said they were cancer, a cancer veteran. So we have the cancer graduate, the, the cancer veteran, and we have the overcomer. A lot of people, or several people rejecting the term survivor because it was too medical. It, 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 and they wanted, to, they wanted to adopt their own language, unique language. And so in looking and attacking these metaphors and expanding, you know, the, memos, the memos were the best way to do that. Coding just didn't cut it for that particular task. I needed to have both codes and memos so that I could really um, um, unlock the, the mystery of those metaphors. Yeah, very good. So I hope, I hope that helps. Um, so um, I don't wanna go too much in the weeds on, on this slide. This is looking at um, you know, all of the different tasks involved in, in um, in our work at the analysis stage, perhaps looking at demographics, uh, the conceptual ordering, ordering of codes and subcodes and code linkages, developing code diagrams, developing a code book, which means defining each code very, very systematically so that we can really um, 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 sort of align the data more with, with um, how we are defining certain ideas like the cancer graduate idea. If that becomes a code, or knowledge acquisition, if that becomes a code, I need to somehow figure out how I'm how I'm defining that, how I'm making sense of it, so that I can really hold on to that to that I, that that definition for, for guidance throughout the rest of the of the analysis stage. Um, so you know, these are just some ideas regarding um, getting more into the weeds. Um, we do have a chapter, a couple chapters in the book that address software, and this is an example of a diagram in a um, program called Atlas TI. This is just showing how uh, quotations are linked to each other. I'm sorry, not just quotations, but how codes are linked to each other. And we have a few examples here of quotes. So this is um, uh, um, one of the advantages of using software is that you have all these tools available to you to kind of help you wrestle with, um, with different levels of inquiry, um, different, kind, different, different kinds of data. Um, in different pieces of data. We might have quotations as well as codes, as well as themes. Well, I might wanna incorporate all of that into a diagram and software can help you do that. I wanna um, kind of pause here for a minute just to um, kind of share how the book for me was also a form of instruction. The authors that kind of um, helped um, were my, more my teachers, right? I was the co-editor, but they were my teacher. And in looking, in looking at, um, in looking at some of the um, language of the uh, of the contributors, I really, I, I really was sort of sort of um, uh, startled at the insight that they were sharing. And I'll read this one um, quotation from Jamie Fiddler. She, she, was, she was the researcher who used in, index cards in her, in her approach. She says, the index cards allowed me to see these images at a glance to be guided back to them if needed. They allowed me to live my ontology as I engaged in the analysis. Um, so what, what Jamie is getting at here is how these index cards really allowed her an entry point into ideas. And they allowed her to live her ontology. I love that. This is going back to worldviews, right? And our paradigm from the, the early slides of this talk. Um, 
an ontology is not something that you just um, check off a, a checklist. It's something that you're living as a researcher. And this practice of the note cards allowed her to live her ontology. A remarkable statement. So that's Jamie Fiddler. Um, this next quotation from Alison Welker and George Cambrellis, um, their, their chapter again was on, on mapping and linking and in, in indexicality. Um, they say in their chapter that the map in the researcher's mind can almost never be fully shared or explained. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't try <laughs> to share and explain it. It just means that um, this, is, this is the struggle of the quality of researcher, right? We have all of these things that we're noticing constellations is what I'll call them. We have a constellation in our mind. How do we share that in a research um, article, in a dissertation, in a blog post? Um, so that is the challenge. And that's sometimes why we move to arts-based practices where we can use things like um, paint, a paintbrush, uh, which might be better than a PowerPoint slide for some things. Mm -hmm. And here's the final quote that I wanted to share with you all from um, Dr. Nishida, one of our, one of our contributors. Um, she says that, um, well, she, her, her chapter was about um, turning data into stories and investing in narrative analysis. And she says, although the function of the stories was identified, up to this point, the narrative as a whole still made little sense. Um, here, um, Aisha, um, which is her first name, she is kind of reminding us of this space of ambiguity that we must inhabit as researchers and the, the struggles of living in ambiguity for a stretch of time. And the fact that we might understand the parts, but the narrative as a whole might still be hard to sort of ascertain. And that doesn't mean that we can't get there. It just means that we have to um, use all of these all of these approaches we're talking about, all, all these practices, as I should, I should say, and strategies to, um, to find um, a way through this ambiguity to something more meaningful. And we, um, we also have in the book a few chapters on writing up our analysis and ways of thinking about different kinds of research products like comics um, and ethno theater, uh, Johnny Saldana's chapter looks at how we can dramatize an interview and think of it as something that we would see on stage, something that could be performed. And that is a, another entry point into, into knowledge acquisition is using theater as a vehicle for, um, for knowing, a vehicle, a vehicle for knowing. And we also have um, a chapter looking at ways beyond an academic article to disseminate knowledge, such as blogs and, art and uh, white papers and other, way, other ways like newspaper articles of reaching a larger audience. Yeah, and that's, um, I think that's one of our strengths of their book there is um, the book's openness and support for many ways to communicate qualitative research, many ways to write it up. Um, Sally Campbell Goldman's chapter on comic book research is just a great piece and something I think that will inspire a lot of people. Um, Jessica Geelan, um, her chapter on blogs and white paper on conceptual papers all um, is also a great um, piece. And so um, really thinking through, um, you know, um, how do I get the story out? How do I um, you know, communicate what matters in this data to, you know, people in my field and my discipline, but then to the community, to the world at large? Um, you know, those are really good questions to think about. And those are questions where the arts, where you know blogs really um, come in handy. So, anything else, Paul? Any wrap up? Hmm. I, I guess. You want maybe, me to stop sharing? 
Well, I guess maybe I will just um, um, end with this with this idea of the life cycle and just to remind people yeah. that you are living in a life cycle, right? That um, and just to kind of remember that you're that you're in a, you're in a river, you're in a moving river, yeah, um, and so we sometimes think of research. Um, in these static phases and they sort of, or, and I, I like to just remind myself that everything's always moving constantly and just to um, be, being attentive to that in a way is liberating, right? Um, and so even though, you know, a piece of writing, when I'm finished with it, it becomes, it seems to be this static thing, but e even that is sort of, as, as we all know, it's never ever really finished. It's published, but it, may, it doesn't mean it's really finished. It's still, it's still on another destination, which is, you know, in a few years, you'll have a different version of that idea. And so I, I really like to think about um, embracing motion in our work and not and not sort of thinking of stasis as our, as a goal. Really, the goal is to keep moving. Well, and that refers then to chapter three of, in our book where we talk about secondary data analysis and, um, you know, the importance of both um, First of all, allowing yourself to do secondary data analysis and to work with IRB, with your people you interview, to make sure your study can continue for those new cycles, and then to figure out, you know, how does this all, you know, move into more of a publicly available archive? What needs to happen? How do I structure things? Because then our field grows. You know, we have more, you know, more data to discover, but it also is, it reduces burden, right? We don't have to go back to the Kent State shootings and ask survivors yet again to speak about that trauma. We can use, um, you know, um, interviews that have been conducted 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and um, to try to think through those issues as, you know, social science and the questions we would ask about that content. Exactly, I think that, that ex extending the lifespan of our data is a, is a goal that we should all consider. Um, Maybe the last question is, tell us a little bit about the 18th annual qualitative research summer intensive. Well, well, this is, uh, we just ended the, we just finished the intensive a few weeks ago. Um, but so we're in the planning stages for next year. Um, but the, the research intensive really is a, is a way for people to um, gain experiential knowledge. And so not just kind of having somebody talk at you, but actually doing stuff while you're in class um, to try out some of these things that we've talked about in this, in this, um, in this presentation. So the intensive, which was created by Research Talk a number of years ago, Ray Maeda is the president of Research Talk, and um, the the Odom Institute where I am, we've we've partnered with Research Talk um, um, in the in the last um, eight nine years. Um, but the, the intensive was around long before then. So it's just, it's a, simply a way for uh, researchers to gain skills um, in analysis and interpretation, but also in design and in writing. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for giving us this time. Um, I am going to stop recording.